Hello and welcome back to the NUFC Opinion Blog for another Newcastle's Legends interview. I'm joined today by Heart Radio Northeast's very own Emil Franchi, also formerly of Gallagher Shots fan cam series. So please check all of that out if you haven't already. Emil, how are you? I'm very well. It's uh, I'm quite taken aback to be described as a legend of, of the uh, of the world, but um, I'll take <laughs> it. I will put it on my CV, and um, I will I will tell everyone to uh, check this out as well. Thank you very much. Well, I mean, you're joining a, you're joining an illustrious band of people we've had on so far. So I I feel you're very much worthy of that title. Especially I'm honoured. What you've done. Thank you. Honestly, very, no, honored, you're very welcome to, to be alongside those names that you've mentioned already. So uh, yeah, very pleased yeah. to be here. <laughs> so firstly, just just as a very brief sort of start question, how did your love for Newcastle United start? Wow, um, what a question. My love for Newcastle United probably started just from my dad's influence. My dad is a massive Newcastle United fan, um, although his patience is wearing thin with them at the minute. Uh, that came from uh, my granddad, um, you know, South, South Tyneside born. Um, so, you know, going to the matches when he was younger, my dad was at the, the Fairs Cup uh, home leg. Oh, wow. Um, so he's got loads of programs for that showing off his age there but you know <laughs> he's fo- followed Newcastle through that and was a was an avid attendee until uh until I guess maybe like the 80s and when I was born in the 90s so um yeah after that I think first memory of, of football kind of kicks in towards the um the year 2000 perhaps I think the when, year I was uh, born you're yeah, old. all right. Well, there you go. I feel old now, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, year 2000, I think, was when I really started to notice black and white being forced on me. Um, and I think I saw my dad get really angry when um, when Don Hutchinson, Don Hutchinson scored uh, the winner in, in the derby uh, for Sunderland, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I couldn't understand why he was so, so uh, peeved. And I thought... What's what? Well, oh, is that not good? And, and he went, no, that's awful. And he was in a terrible mood. And then, <laughs> um, and then slowly but surely, I realised more and more what it was going to be like to support Newcastle. And uh, and yeah, got taken to a game, Boxing Day two thousand and one, where we beat Middlesbrough three nil. And um, yeah, the rest the rest is history. Mm, very good. Obviously, given your love for the for the club, you were once part of Gallagher Shots doing the fan cams. Was was that an ideal role for you, given? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. Um, Always, always very appreciative of the opportunity that I had to do with Gallagher Shots and um, a a great example of just seeing something from afar and then um, letting someone know that you like the work, um, which was all of the guys at Gallagher Shots, namely uh, Chris and and Mark and and Decker, who were doing the podcast when I joined. And uh, yeah, just got in front of camera one time. Um, This is before I started doing the fan cams. And um, and started doing player ratings, and it was just a chance for me to try and do a bit more stuff on camera. Because uh, if you, if you're not aware of radio, um, you'll, you'll know that you're not really speaking to anyone or, or on screen quite often. So it was a chance for me to just do a bit of that. And um, and yeah, as I got more comfortable with it, we just decided, right, well, should we uh, go and stand outside the ground? And it was uh, cruelly cut short, unfortunately, by the um, by coronavirus. Yeah. It was th- this time last year was the last time. I was outside of a ground doing it, and um, and yeah, it's a, it's a shame that we couldn't go back and do it again. But I'm mm. sure it'll happen sometime soon. Obviously, at the moment, the club's not in exactly the best of states, but things certainly on the pitch are not brilliant, and off the pitch, you could even argue as well. Oh dear, yeah. So no. what, what are your thoughts on it all? Oh, I mean, it's it, it's a horrible sinking feeling. Um, when Newcastle get into this position, no one wants to be there. And um, it's it's especially frustrating, I think, for all the fans at the minute to be proven right. Um, you know, I, I'll hold my hands up sometimes and admit when I'm wrong as a fan about players or decisions or, or, or games. But when everything that you've been saying is slowly coming true and it almost feels like you're shouting at no one, whether it's um, opposing pundits, um, sorry, opposing fans, pundits alike, um, and, and, and especially shouting at the club saying, do something, 
and knowing that it's not going to actually achieve anything, it just makes you mm -hmm. feel so powerless. And I think that's exactly how <clears throat> I would describe Newcastle United fans. You know, everyone can say that we we perhaps hound out managers and we we make our voices heard, but we have to make our voices heard a little bit louder than than more fans this year, especially because there's no one in the ground. Yeah. And and you know we, we're we're talking sometimes to a, a brick wall, and and that's how it feels. So. Given what you've just said there, if you had some sort of position of power at Newcastle United, whether it be manager, owner, etc., just somewhere in the hierarchy, how would you go about making changes? And namely, what changes would you make? Well, isn't that the question? <laughs> I guess I would make the club to it. To I, I would make us run properly. I, I would like to see Newcastle United run where there is a communication with the fans. Um, I would like to make us feel in a similar way that Leicester feels. Um, they, they seem to have, I mean, you, you saw the outpouring of grief when when their, um, when their owner sadly passed away in that terrible accident. Um, and, and, and you've since seen what his son and, and the affection that there is for that family that have taken over. And bear in mind that we've got an owner from this country. So you'd think that there was a, like an, an easier connection with them. I'm not, I'm not saying that we would be adverse to any foreign owners coming in, but when you think of someone being from this country, they probably know what the club's about. And it feels like at the minute that the owner doesn't. So I think that if I was uh, perhaps in that position where you were in charge of communicating a bit better with, with fans, and, and making them involved, you'd value them slightly more than what they are at the minute, which is essentially just uh, ticket sales, um, mugs to buy the shirt sometimes, mm -hmm. and, and and just a cash cow that will flock to the ground because we are just so uh, like lovesick with Newcastle that we can't walk away but it pains us enough to go. It's very strange, isn't it? But I, yeah, to answer your question, I think that I would like to see us run better to incorporate the fans yeah. into the everyday at Newcastle. Make us likeable. I would like to make it nice for the fans to, to, to go um, because it seems like there are teams who don't do as well. Um, like, I don't know, like Burnley perhaps, um, or, or even Brighton with their manager currently in place. It would just feel better if we at least showed the the steps that we could make to, to keep everyone on side and, and, and literally live up to our name of United. Of course, things haven't always been this doomy and gloomy at Newcastle United. There have been better days in the past. We all, we all know this. We all feel nostalgic, reminisce, etc. So if you had to pick maybe one or two of your best memories supporting the club, what would they be? Uh, well, um, when I first went to uni, I I got my first season ticket. Um, not, not afraid to say that I, um, I I took it on the cheap when uh, they got reduced because we'd started so well and no one expected it. But I thought, you know what? Um, I couldn't afford this any other time. So student loan came in. I was like, right, let's get that. And me and my mate got great seats in the Gallagher. And, and that just happened to be Pardew's wonder season. So ah, finished fifth. Um, it yeah. didn't it didn't go badly at all in terms of the chances of that. Obviously, we, we knew that we had a good start, but um, I, I watched I watched Newcastle beat Man United three 0 I my watched us... the match I've been to. Yeah, just, well, as, exactly. just as it happens, that was my first season ticket as well. Was it? Well, there you go. Uh, yeah. It seemed like a good year to get one, didn't it? Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the three 0 Man United, as you know, the, the Liverpool two 0 when we had Jose Enrique in goal. Papi mm -hmm. C says like meteoric rise to the top as well as Denver bar banging them in. We just felt amazing like that year. And that, that would be my ideal season because from that we should have done so much more, but then Newcastle's mm. weird ownership kicks in and then all of a sudden it's like, no, 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 we, we can't do anything to, um, to consolidate this, which mm. always frustrates me, even like with with Rafa in charge. Um, but yeah, th those those are kind of like my my best memories because I think that those were the times when I was actually able to go to the pub before the match, uh, struggle to get out of the pub before the match sometimes, <laughs> uh, and in the pub after the match quite a lot. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, just just that that was when it was kind of like it became a tradition for me. 
um, and and I've, I've I've been in and out of the area of the northeast since uh, doing bits and bobs. So uh, it hasn't been possible to. Well, I actually had a season ticket before the season got cancelled again, but um, yeah, that, that wasn't to be. But but yeah, I think there's just there's just some of those moments. Um, I mean, I still will remember Matty Longstaff's goal in uh, the the other season for for a long time because that just was a, a sheer release of um joy and and um like just ecstasy how it felt when everyone just went mad i mean i ran along the concourse it was just like this is this is what it should be local lads scoring the winner against a team that we we know we've got the history with that's those are the moments that i would like love to keep at newcastle united and i always think of those moments as like you know the, the games that you don't expect to win I always think like, you know, if we had loads of money, would those moments get taken away? So um That's a very well, good point. That's a very interesting point. I've never really yeah. heard that. If you expected to, if you expected to win every game, then you wouldn't enjoy it as much, I don't think. I mean it'd be nice and it'd be lovely to be like Man City and we know that they don't win every year, but um to go into a game where you are the underdog, nothing beats the feeling of coming out of that on top. So perhaps games... that's why being sort of a similar club to maybe Leicester would be a good thing because they don't, you know, certainly they're a good team and that they're doing very well, but they're certainly not the favourites in every single game. No, so. no, exactly. And 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 you look at the way that people like James Madison speak. You've got veterans there like Jamie Vardy. Um, even after they won the league, they didn't say, "Right, that's it. We're we're done now. We've done what we set out to achieve." You've seen them going for it every single year, and they've tried to get managers in who fit that um, that psychology and the, and the and the culture of the club. Um, I'm just jealous. Jealous every time of teams like Leicester and and even Everton this season, yeah. Villa this season. Every team that somehow manages to kick on from the bad times and learns those lessons. Again, Newcastle just seem to be getting back and back. Mm-hmm. But we're on favourite moments here, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah we should no, be getting, we should stick to the nice stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, mo- moving away from Newcastle now, um, your day to day role at the moment is at Heart Radio North East. Yeah, uh, on the drive time show. So presumably, this is a job you you love doing. Yeah, this is this is the dream job. I mean, um, my dream job will no doubt change, but uh, as things stand and where I am at the minute in terms of what I wanted to achieve, um, yeah, this is this is the, to be doing it every single day when so many people uh, lose jobs in radio, especially over the last few years. Um, it, it it is the dream to be doing it, especially when um, I am in my own area. Not many people get to do that, so um it's a it's a real privilege and i'm very grateful for that opportunity every time um, um to get to where you are though at the minute at heart radio with that position you've had to work with other various stations from from newcastle student radio to radio tyneside to star radio northeast but was radio always the plan um fr- from which point <laughs> uh, well say six years old <laughs> say i maybe from sort of a levels or yeah um you know i've always had a passion for performance um i've always had a passion to do not not so much being like the center of attention you know but 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 i'd always be the person who was involved in um theater live events at school there was a there was a a a real keenness to um be entertaining and and that's what i'd like to do so whether it was organizing events, hosting events, performing at events, any of that, it felt like it felt like something I should be doing. Um, quite an outgoing person, as you can probably imagine. Um, so when I got to uni, that was when it was a case of being like, right, well, what what can I do? Like, uh, what can I do here? What can I do there? Because at school, if you're the regular person to do that, um, it normally falls to you to do it. Whereas at uni, you are packed in with so many other like-minded people who are in societies and things like that. So, so yeah, I signed up for student radio literally on the first few days of um, arriving at Newcastle Uni, and um, and yeah, I just um, I, I took to it. I, I liked it. I wasn't very good at it because um, it was just a case of like chatting to a mate. 
um, in a room. And um, I mean, the, the first show we ever did, the server wasn't working. We found out afterwards. So it was just me and him talking to a wall. But th those, those are the things that kind of, those are the things that you start off with. You know, you, you'll have those, those moments and um, you laugh at them now. Um, but yeah, I think as soon as I really started getting into that and people started saying, oh, you are quite good at this, you know, um, and, and namely, as you mentioned, Radio Tyneside, that was the place doing hospital radio where I started to make the right contacts. Um, uh, a guy called Dave Nicholson, um, who, who still runs the place. He's, he's an absolute trooper in that department. Um, one of the, the legend of hospital radio, literally he's been in it for like over 40 years. Um, and, and a real, real passionate person that you need at those kind of places. He kind of championed us to uh, go further forward. And, um, and Radio Time said, obviously, a, a historic for the city that do match day commentary still every single every single game for the hospital patients who they serve. And um, and yeah, from from there, when I started to make contacts and go to events and network, that was when it started to really click. And then I went, well, maybe we should maybe we should try and do this. And uh, one of those contacts actually gave me my first job in um, Stoke on Trend. So, yeah, it all worked out. So for someone looking to follow in your footsteps and sort of recreate or, or follow the path that you, you've taken into radio, what sort of advice or what sort of hints and tips would you give to that sort of person? You, you've got to be willing to do absolutely anything at first in terms of to get yourself um, experience because you can't walk into any job in radio, unfortunately. Um, you know, if, if you're coming from purely... Um, a student background or a radio background, you might get the odd person who has managed to get their way into one of the bigger roles. Um, and, and look, that, that doesn't mean they've worked any harder than you. Sometimes you have to be in the right place at the right time with the right contact. Um, I would say that you will just have to be willing to go above and beyond um, whatever because you know you might go to a station like a, a community station because there's so many of them popping up at the minute and you'll probably do stuff that isn't paid there's very, it's very likely that you won't get on the radio straight away either you've just got to be in everyone's face and not feel like you're being a nuisance i think there's a there's a fine line that you can tread with being a nuisance and being pretty useful um and when you make yourself indispensable that's when you start to get more stuff and from there, you build the experience, you go up and up and up, and you have to just hang on to that lad ladder as much as you can and realise that as soon as you get to the top of that ladder, there's another one to climb. Because, you know, I've kind of did the, the rise of student radio, up the hospital radio ladder, um, commercial radio ladder. I'm, I'm kind of at the top of the regional um, radio ladder now because th there isn't like a, another show for me to, to to go up to if you like in in the in the in the region, um, or at least I don't think so. But um, but after this, it's kind of like for me personally, my ambition is to get to national radio. But if I hop onto that ladder, I'll, I know that I'll be at the very bottom of that. So you you've just got to you've just got to be ready for a long old slog, but it's worth it every day because I just get to chat every single day. And finally, just to bring it back to Newcastle United, oh, obviously, we <laughs> well, this is this is the NUFC opinion blog. So yes, I thought, sorry, I, th I, I thought we probably should, but obviously, as we mentioned, this season is is not being brilliant. Just as sort of a little prediction, are we staying up? Are we not? Oh God, what a call for me to make. Um, I said to you just before before we started. I think that it's going to be very tight and I think we're going to see another John Carver final day relegation season where we didn't go down. Um, I'd, lo I'd love to think that we're going to have someone come back from, um, you know, someone going to come back, beat cancer, score the winning goal and it'll be another fairy tale again, but I don't think it's going to have that fairy tale quality. I think it's going to be gritty. It's going to be nasty. I think that it's just going to come down to who has luck on their side between us, Brighton, and Fulham. Fulham have got the momentum, so they might hit a few stumbling blocks if they get the stuff and knocked out of them, which we hope will against Man City or those teams. Um, but yeah, I think that it's just going to come down to what happens when we get these injuries out the way. Because because that, that's where the goals are. And if yeah, we can't score very goals, true. we're going to have performances like we did against West Brom and, and, and others this season. But 
even then, you don't know, do you? I think I'd love to think that we are going to stay up, but I'm the eternal optimist. I think it'll be skin of the teeth. The only thing with, with what you said there about the sort of West Ham with Jonas Gutierrez scoring that goal, the season after we went down. Oh yeah, I, I have every I have every faith that we will go down next season if we don't learn from this one. Yeah, and and look. Can you blame me for being pessimistic on that one? Probably not. No, I don't think I'm anyone. with you in that camp completely. I, I, I don't think we will go down, but I think that if we come close again, some wholesale change needs to happen, whether it's um, some sort of takeover gets pushed through. Um, maybe it might it might not be the one that we want, but if someone is ready to take the club forward and 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 go down the um, the, the body that we kind of discussed there, than about Leicester. Yeah. Um, we, we, we don't want riches as a club. I didn't want riches until we got told about the riches last summer, but obviously the whole mess of it just made me want it less and less because, you know, the, I, I, listen, I tried very uh, a lot last year to listen to so many opinions about the takeover. And, you know, I listened to both sides and I thought, you know what, actually, there's, there's, there's actually quite a lot of stuff that's going to come with this if they take us over the Saudi thing. We're going to be everyone's hated team. You know, I know Man City fans have to put up with it a little bit, but there are still some elements that didn't sit well with me. And I was worried that our fan base would not realise that. Um, so we, we'll see what happens, but I'm not opposed to anything. Uh, but something major needs to happen if we manage to survive this year. I think with, with, with the Saudi takeover, I think the way I look at it, yes, there are things that there are to be questioned about these people who potentially might take us over, but I'd rather have that money than, say, for example, be Sunderland and end up in someone like League One. I think that's, that's true. That's true. That's Absolutely. the way you look at it. Yeah, I, I know. But, I that, that's my personal way of looking yeah, at it. Yeah, no, I, I, I think, yeah. I think I, I'm with you on that respect, you know, but um, we have the money now, that's the bit. And we, we, we're not yeah. like Sunderland now. We've got an owner who's absolutely capable of keeping us in like an Arsenal level. And we, we, we could come under Mike Ashley, we could comfortably be sort of mid table, potentially every now and then push for Europa League. Yeah. Put the money in and, and you will reap the rewards. Put mm. some money into the training ground, put some money into the youth academy, get some decent mind I mean, we had a good managerial mind in terms of looking at that and I, I will never understand why things never oh, that, man there. To why. Yep. that man there there he is yeah. <laughs> we're not obsessed it's just I got that I got that and then he left so uh, oh, well about the season before but even so I mean it just it, it, you know it's um, we, we can't look back but we just have to hope that something Yeah, I have every faith that Newcastle United will be back one day I just don't know when that, that's a very good point and hopefully it rings true one day. Emil, thank you very much for joining me. I, I really appreciate it. Pleasure, Daniel. You're doing a great job with this. Thank so I, I encourage all other uh, NUFC legends, as uh, Daniel described as us, to come on and do this. <laughs> well, that, if that's not an incentive enough, I don't know what is. So thank There's you. There's none all. left. There's none left. We've done them all. Have, I think, have we finished it now? Is that the yeah, end? Yeah, this is it. The, 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 it stops now. Guest list only after this. Fair enough. I'll just scrap the little ticket tick list that I've got next to me <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah. Burn it. <laughs> anyway, thank you all very much for watching at home. I hope everyone is staying safe, everything, etc. Because yeah. this is why I do these sort of interviews. But yeah. Anyway, thank you all very much for watching and how are the lads? How are the lads? <laughs>